You'll find uh, this slide deck posted, uh, but what I'm going to present to you is slightly altered as of uh, early this morning, so I'll repost the presentation that I'm going to share with you uh, at this point. A little bit of the history of the term emotional intelligence. It first appeared in the psychological literature in 1990 in an academic journal article by two psychologists, John Mayer and Peter Salobi. And then it gained about five years later wide recognition in 1995 in a book that you've probably seen written for the general public by Daniel Goleman entitled Emotional Intelligence, Why It Can Matter More Than IQ. Since the 1990s, the concept of emotional intelligence or emotional quotient or more recently emotional competence has become an acceptable field of study within the discipline of psychology. But not without disagreement among psychologists, some of whom maintain that emotional intelligence really is another way of describing IQ and a repackaging of psychological characteristics already identifiable in standard psychological testing that we already have. What is emotional intelligence? Generally defined as a constellation of abilities, competencies, and dispositions related to perceiving, understanding, and managing the emotions of oneself and those of others. The ability to, and we're indebted to uh, Nancy Stott for pulling together from our committee, pulling together a, a couple of these definitions that I'm going to share now. The ability to perceive, utilize, and manage one's own and others' emotions. The use of the term emotional competence more accurately describes the individual's ability to enact and demonstrate the intelligence and not just possess the intelligence, which is why I like uh, the term emotional competence better and is better um, uh, tapped in terms of 360 instruments where you get others' feedback on the individual in terms of their capacity not just to know but to demonstrate. Someone who can perceive emotions is self-aware and can identify what they are feeling. They can also pick up on verbal and more importantly in some ways nonverbal signals and recognize what others may be feeling. They also have the ability to utilize their emotions in decision making, problem solving, and other cognitive processes so that those tasks are an adaptive combination of thinking and feeling in real time. And that's the important thing to say about really this statement, which is the importance of being able to do that in real time, read oneself, another, and make adjustments in terms of thinking and feeling. One with emotional competence is able to manage their own emotions and to influence the emotions and the tenor of things around them. People who can manage their feelings typically are not overwhelmed by their feelings and because of that then are more tolerant of stress, more able to modulate their stress. They can deal better with interpersonal issues and conflict without ignoring or fleeing, and they're often able, even in the moment, to calm other people who are overwrought. What we think about as self-regulation and to some degree other regulation. There are at least 37 tests that promise to measure emotional competence that have appeared in recent years. Some seem promising, but many, the most, really have not been empirically based, uh, empirically evaluated in terms of outcome-based research. If you're looking for a, a, a really good source to help you take a look at what instruments you might be considering, I would direct you to the Consortium for Research on Emotional Intelligence in Organizations, which is based at uh, Rutgers University and offers a very nice objective assessment of most of the emotional competency uh, instruments that are out there and you see the website address. Two recommended measures that if you're going to move in the direction of considering an, emotionally, an emotional competence test, uh, the 
two that have the most robust statistical data behind them are the Boron Equi360 and the Mayer Solovi Caruso EI test, uh, uh, shorthand known as the Maset. In the Virginia Conference, well, I'll say a little bit about that in just a minute. Um, just a, a couple of words about the Boron, which is named for a gentleman uh, by that name. 133 items, takes about a half hour to fill out and is a multi-rater version, so it's a 360 and you get input from other persons who know the individual. And it looks at several domains. The first, the intrapersonal domain in terms of the categories of self-regard, emotional self-awareness, assertiveness, independence, and self-actualization. In terms of the interpersonal, it looks at the categories of empathy, social responsibility, and interpersonal relationships. In terms of stress management, it looks at the individual's stress tolerance and their impulse control, their ability, you know, how, how much blood flow do they get to the prefrontal cortex in a moment of uh, stress uh, and conflict and how much can they regulate themselves in that moment. It looks at adaptability, uh, the person's reality testing, the person's flexibility, and the person's problem-solving ability. And then finally, it looks at the general mood of the individual in terms of uh, the level of optimism the individual possesses and the general level of happiness that the individual has. In terms of the Maset, uh, 141 items, uh, roughly the same number of items, and test taking time about 30 to 45 minutes. And it looks at the areas of perceiving emotions, facilitating thought, understanding emotions, and managing emotions, those particular areas. And what I started to say a while ago, other uh, instruments being used, the ESCI is being used by the Virginia Conference, and uh, we're going to save our discussion time till after Richard finishes his presentation, but we'd be interested in knowing what other EI instruments that uh, you might be using in your conference. What case apps to tie us back into yesterday's discussion and to some degree the personal reference form uh, earlier? What, what case apps do we want to look for in any emotionally, in any emotional competence instrument? Integrity, and this is right off of the chart that I uh, shared with you yesterday in terms of those 13 case apps. Uh, certainly you want to look for integrity, you want to look for authenticity, you want to look for oral communication, you want to look for dependability, and you want to look for calling, which is often uh, found in the emotional competency uh, instruments uh, under commitment is most often how that translates. And in terms of, um, and there you see uh, in the slide, which of those are personal characteristics, which are skill sets, and thinking back to uh, what Bishop McGee said a while ago uh, as he was uh, being introduced, uh, the personal characteristics, very important to keep in mind that the personal characteristics are really quite stable over time. Uh, meaning particularly uh, more resistant to intervention, uh, but can be impacted with sustained intervention. So it's not that they're not, it's not that they're impact proof or bulletproof, but uh, 12 sessions of therapy uh, is not going to move a deficit or a concern uh, for personal characteristics or abilities. So don't be sending those people for short-term therapy because uh, it's not going to work. Current research in terms of the emotional competency instruments. Very important uh, for research going forward in the field to connect the emotional competency assessment results with outcome in terms of performance in given occupations. And so that's a very important and ongoing area of research. That is how predictive is scores on an emotional competency instrument to a successful outcome in the work environment. I'm not aware of any outcome studies with clergy using uh, EC instruments. There may be some, but none have come to my attention. 
Most of the research in the field suggests that IQ, in comparison, accounts for about 20% of a person's career success, their basic uh, native IQ, leaving about 80% of success in any work environment related to a variety of other factors, some of that of which we would know to be emotional competency, but how much of that, of that 80%, we really don't know at this stage of the game. For a more comprehensive review, review, I would direct you to the emotional competence framework that uh, Dr. Hunt uh, put onto our resource, so it's on the web page under resources, that comes out of the Consortium for Research on Emotional Intelligence and Organizations, so it'll be there on the website, but it's a, about a four-page document that does a very nice job of laying out for us uh, and a, mo a very nice emotional competence framework. And so, there's now a considerable body of research that suggests that a person's ability to perceive, identify, and manage emotion provides the basis for the kinds of social and emotional competencies that are important and really crucial for success in almost any job, certainly that of ministry. And there are a variety of ways to access emotional competency. Uh, one of those is through one or more of the emotional competence instruments that I've just been referring to. Another is in terms of general psychological instruments, some of which would be several versions of the 16PF. The California Personality Inventory Coaching Report is another very interesting uh, helpful instrument. The Leadership Circle Profile is another, as well as clinical and group uh, interviews, uh, as well as the CPE experience. Uh, should you be interested in uh, additional conversation, uh, you can reach me uh, at that um, email address or phone number. Richard. Can you get me on to our PDF? Where's our full screen spot? Oh, it's up there. Okay, okay. I think we know what we're doing. Okay, uh, as I thought about uh, what we can say at this hour about emotional competence, I think I can sum it up in two slides, and then I'll have some comments, and then you'll see the two slides. Uh, the work Chernus, you have a couple of those articles on your materials. Generally, it says that EI, emotional intelligence, seems to be more a trait, and it's located in the brain, uh, probably in the pre pre uh, prefrontal cortex. And as I think about that, I'm reminded of a colleague of mine who does a lot of work on split brain uh, conditions, and the corpus agenesis is the corpus callosum, which means simply there are not many neurons that connect the two sides of the brain. And I said, well, about how many neurons are there? Oh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 million. So we have 200 million connections between these various parts of the brain, and probably in the prefrontal cortex is the spot in the brain where information about social relationships is stored. You then have to have that connected in other ways. So if you think of I'd like to think of EI as that trait, the cognitive component of social relationships. And then the ESC, the emotional and social competence, as the application of that information to social situations. And then that being a part of one's uh, personality. So how much of this, perhaps this is all of personality in some ways, perhaps it's a component of personality, but it certainly is 
how we engage other people in all of our social relationships. So what are the best ways to measure? This is the other slide. Best ways to measure, Vic uh, describes some of the self-report measures, and um, those are helpful but not adequate. I can report to you what I think my social competence is. That doesn't mean that that's necessarily grounded in reality. And the next step up would be the observer report measures, uh, like the ones he mentioned, uh, the letters of reference, any kind of a 360 type of procedure in which you can compare the individual's self-perception with the perception of others of that individual. But that's still, it, it's better, but it's limited. And then moving from that to observational measures, uh, how does this person operate in either simulated or real life situations? So the assessment center method provides an opportunity for an individual to operate in a given setting and to be observed in that setting as to how well they function. For years on the um, profiles of ministry, I'd hoped uh, Dan Alshar yesterday would maybe have brought in a little bit more. How many of you know profiles of ministry, anybody? Uh, that's what I thought. That's one of the disconnects between our research and uh, ATS research. But there are two, two sets of uh, profiles, stage one, stage two. Stage one is one that comes in at the beginning of a seminary career, stage two at the end of one seminary career. And in stage two, there are situations that are described. Here's a situation, half a page or so, what would you do? How do you see persons in that situation responding? What do they need? All those kinds of questions. And it's a lot like an assignment that I've often used with students. Go to a movie, any kind of movie. Pick a particular scene in that movie. It may be a husband and wife or a man and a woman engaged with each other. It may be a person in some kind of a social setting. Pick that scene, watch it for two, three, four second, uh, minutes, and then imagine that you could rewrite that scene in a way that would make it a more healthy outcome. You don't have to worry about whether that rewrite is going to make money. You don't have to worry about whether the rewrite has enough sex or violence or whatever else in it to make it sell. All you have to worry about is you're in this situation. You may be the therapist. This person or this couple or this group comes in for you for help. What are you going to do next? And imagine that that happens to you at 3 o'clock in the morning. So what are you going to do next with this situation? I think that's what uh, social emotional competence is. What am I going to do next in this situation? So if I could do anything right now, I'd say push for at least simulated situations, uh, situations in which the individual can look at this situation and uh, give some kind of response about what they would do next, a situation in which they may be themselves, and most of our interview situations are that. They're simulated in the sense that, on the one hand, they are, they are real, for sure, but in another sense, it's how this individual is interacting with the other persons there and uh, all the many ways in which they can respond. The rest I'm going to zip through rather quickly. Uh, can we blame a pastor's failure on a lack of emotional competence? And I'm using the word competence all the way through. I'm not too worried about where in the brain this stuff may be stored or anything like that. I'm worried about what happens between that individual and others so if we say, well, the pastor didn't do very well because she or he doesn't have much emotional competence, that's really like saying, well, the pastor doesn't do well because the pastor doesn't do well. And so you want to get beyond that into what is it I provided, just so you know it's biblical, a couple of references here so you'll have them. Um, the key question is, to what extent is EI as a trait that is patterns that are not likely to change with any interventions that are typically available to BOMs or supervisors or, or MASs or others, or to what extent are there 
patterns that can be changed if they just had some help. The very simplest is, if that person could just speak English more proficiently, would they be able to function better? Well, the answer is yes, of course. That's one thing you could change. If this person w would stop and listen to what the other person's saying, instead of pulling out their cell phone or something else and twiddling with it while the other person's talking, would there be a change in the behavior and in, in, in the situation? So this may be a, a helpful division to know which are the things we can't change readily, which are the things that we can. Um, I want to take it back to Wesley's criteria for effective ministries, paragraph 304 in our Bible. Um, do they know grace? Do they know God as a pardoning God? And I like the, the structure of the Gospel of Mark, which there are five episodes of calling, healing, nurturing, and sending. This is what we do in worship. This is what we do in many of our human relationships. We're called together to understand each other, to hear God's word to us, and so on, to be healed so that uh, the stuff that we have that needs healing doesn't get in the way of somebody else's healing. We are then nurtured, taught, learned how to do better next time, sent out to do something about it. So this, this cycle. The gifts, are there evidences of God's grace in a person's talents, traits, uh, patterns that, that that person has? Fruit, does anybody get better because of what we do or say? And if they do, fine, that's great. How did they get that way? If they don't do better, why? Is it because something we do that blocks the process or something that is just a natural part of them? Uh, I like uh, Sherrod Miller's awareness wheel in which these five steps, we use it with couples, but it's useful in any human situation that one, one person's behavior becomes my sense data. And as I work on that sense data and add to it some interpret, interpretations, uh, whatever language they speak, whatever words they use, whatever key phrases, I add my interpretations of that and then my emotional reactions to that and then formulate what I want to happen, my intention, and then you'll see my behavior. So if you, you can practice this with yourself, with anybody you're talking to, uh, whatever the person says, what are those three steps that nobody sees that are going on for us, our interpretations, our emotions, our intentions, and then what is my response to that? Uh, I think of Emotional competence is being involved, again, in family relationships uh, in which there's the context. We have a certain context. We want to, know, want to know what that is. We have a secret. If you, if you apply this to marriage, we have the context of marriage. What is marriage in our culture? What is our own personal marriage? All of us have a personal marriage that nobody else, not even our spouse, knows. That's always secret with us. We only disclose it if we choose to do so. So then we have a private relationship, whether it's marriage or work or what. This is my private perceptions with others involved about what my work means to me. And then the public aspect of that, what others see happening in this, and finally, how this changes across one's uh, lifetime. These are a lot of factors in, in misconduct as we think about uh, preventing clergy sexual misconduct. What are the factors in that? And as you well know, there, there are a lot of them there. Here are the two instruments that Vic mentioned, uh, the emotional competency, uh, competence inventory, and those categories, the bar on and those categories. So you can go back to these and get them if you'd like. Um, quite a bit of work on the 16PF in relation to uh, measures of uh, emotional competence. And if you look here, these are the competence dimensions. If you look at the basic scales on the 16PF, you'll see that on these various uh, sub composites of emotional competence, that scale A loads very high on a lot of those. So if you look at only scale A and C on 16PF, you will have most of what you can get about emotional competence 
from a self-report measure. The others are there. Um, again, uh, how these load in terms of emotional intelligence or competence, and you have these two, both from uh, the uh, MMPI and the 16PF. And again, some more from that. I'll skip through these because you have it. You can go back and look if you want. The emotional competence measures include typically awareness of one's own emotional emotions, the ability to identify own emotions, ability to identify others' emotions, managing our own emotions, managing others' emotions. And by manage, we mean simply, what do you do with this information? Uh, using emotions and problem solving and expressing emotions. So they're also overlapping, becomes a, a, in a sense a composite. I like just using the term E as emotion. I like to add to that energy. I like to add to that exuberance or excitement. So all of those E words that point to what is the emotional energy that this person brings to the situation and can they use that energy in such a way as to be constructive and healthy. Um, we recently did some research uh, on emotional competence with the uh, um, 16PF and uh, this was published this fall in the Journal of Pastoral Care and Counseling, so you can get that article if you want. But basically it was this, um, higher awareness of emotions, and you, you see the, the composites of these particular measures of emotional competence that 16PF has. And we found that those persons who are high on being aware of emotions typically are high also on being interested in counselors, being a counselor or a spiritual guide ones who are high in enabling them to identify their own emotions, that's the C and O scales, are high on being administrator, being evangelist, and ones who are high on identifying others' emotions are typically high on A all by itself. They're the ones high on counselor and ministry in interest, that is their overall interest in the ministry is higher. The ones who manage their own emotions well typically are higher on counselor, priest, evangelist. Ma and the ones who manage or, or cope with their other emotions tend to be higher on evangelist, administrator, counselor. And you notice all the way through, those who are high on those dimensions are low on scholar. Scholar is the person who wants to withdraw and uh, be more introverted. Uh, study in the library, spend time alone, all that kind of stuff. And they're the ones that typically are not as high, at least by these measures, on their emotional uh, competence. So you can go back and look at that if you'd like. Um, questions to ask, how much is of the same kinds of dimensions uh, put in question form? How much is this person aware of emotions, uh, identify, can they identify emotions, uh, manage their own emotions, and so on. And all the way through, I'm increasingly convinced that we get hung up on the words. Uh, is this emotion, is this empathy, or this sympathy, or is this, th this uh, or the other word? I think all of this is operating at a level be below our verbal level, below language. So we're at emotions, and we have to be careful we don't get carried away or uh, dealing with differences in how you define a particular word in relation to differences in what's the structure of this individual, sort of the character of the individual. If you want to do an exercise, print this out and give it to a few of your colleagues and ask them to rate you, and you rate yourself. See how much convergence there is. It's the same idea that we have in the new uh, uh, reference form that we were talking about. So uh, this would be fun to do if you have the courage to do it. Uh, I'm convinced that we, we need to have observation reports. You can copy that slide and ask some of these questions or feedback uh, in these ways. So you have that, you can go back to it. Um, what can we do in the context of self-report limits? Um, I've worked with self-report measures all my life, 
and I increasingly realize the limits of them. They're a good start, but you know that they're working when you find that you lay aside whatever profile you have and then begin to engage in how does this impact me right now? What can I learn from you that will help me do a better job the next time around? Um, so I'm a big fan of observation, of feedback, and especially of coaching. As you know, coaching is becoming increasingly a dimension that uh, people are learning about, and uh, I, I want to emphasize that. Case studies, here's an example. Um, you can read as well as I. Pastors received a call from a well-known man in the community asking him to come to his house and cope with depression. He and his family are members in your church. His wife is away from home attending a week-long workshop, perhaps on emotional incompetence. No one else is living in their home since their children are grown and living on a home. He asks the pastor to keep this visit confidential. He does not want to meet the pastor at the church where others might know that he's asking for help. He's a major contributor to the church budget. He usually expects to get his way in church matters. You're the pastor. How will you respond? Would it matter if you're a male or a female? Any quick responses on that? It would matter, yeah. So we could spend a lot of time on this kind of case, and if we were doing this in a small group, you could begin, then get a sense of the emotional competence of each person responding according to the responses that they give to this case. So you can take whatever case you want, play that out. Coaching questions about any case, here they are, you'll have them. Um, again, the two slides, if you don't get anything else, self-report measures are helpful to start. Observer report measures are more helpful, um, but they're still limited. Observation measures by trained coach observers who then give feedback are better because you have much more of the reality of this person operating. It's not filtered by language so much. Simulation, simulated settings are good. Actual real life situations are even better. The idea would be to be able, be able to be a fly on the wall observing this person in their daily life context and how well they function in each of those. So again, you can read this with me. EI is part of ESC. ESC is part of personality. Self-reports are helpful, such as 16PF, but not enough. 360 observer reports are helpful. You can try the form with your colleagues. And what we need are real life situations with personal feedback, coaching follow-up, and that iteration. That actually is what the church at its, at its best is all about. How we meet, as John Wesley suggested, how is it with your soul this week? And what have you learned this week that will enable you to work better in these situations in the weeks ahead? That's the end. Uh, questions and observations that uh, any of you may have? And we would be interested in knowing uh, if uh, you're using other uh, EI instruments uh, in your conference that uh, we didn't talk about. Yes. At what stage uh, in candidacy or ministry would you suggest administering an EI instrument? Probably the second stage, but uh, it, it could be at the first stage as well. Uh, at the second stage, uh, they've 
uh, typically been in seminary or licensed uh, school or, or something like that and had a little bit more interaction, especially if you're looking, uh, you're using uh, one of the multi-rating versions where you get input from others, so uh, second stage. But uh, third stage uh, is, is probably even better, but in some ways maybe too late uh, uh, in, in terms of making a decision about a candidate. Thank you. Would, would you have other thoughts about that, Richard? I would say you're doing emotional competence uh, evaluations from the very first time you see the candidate. So as you observe that, I like Chris's, what's the name of yours? Where's Chris? I uh, can't see. Uh, yeah, what is the name of the, uh, the secretary that they had to deal with? You called it the what? The Skicky? Okay, so you have a person like that somewhere, or more than one, how does the candidate respond to that person? And that's the beginning of your assessment of uh, emotional competence. Meg, I see you making your way up here which is a good thing for all of us, I think. I, I was saying at lunch, I, I once was in a setting where I believe it was a, a sermon and not a lecture, and, and, and Bishop McGee said sometimes people have trouble coming in for a landing. They start and then they take off again, and that's what had happened with the speaker about three times. And, and when the speaker finally said, finally, there was applause in the audience. So finally, Meg, 